the reign of Joseph Stalin stands out as a particularly dark period in history. For a quarter century, from the bustling cities of Moscow and Leningrad to the remote villages of Siberia, the USSR was held in an iron grip by this vicious dictator. This was an era defined by a pervasive cult of personality, paranoid purges of potential rivals, and the internment of millions into gulags. An atmosphere of dread permeated every corner of Soviet life. Whispered conversations, suspicious glances, and the ever-present fear of the notorious gulags became the daily reality for millions. Bonds of trust, friendship, and community, the very ties that might have united individuals against Stalin's regime, were obliterated. Instead, fear isolated each individual, making collective resistance almost impossible. Under Stalin's stewardship, the Soviet Union also displayed its might on the global stage, playing a pivotal role in the defeat of Nazi Germany. This victory allowed Stalin to spread his influence, expanding his atomized and totalitarian society over much of Eastern Europe. However, death spares no one. In 1953, the seemingly undefeatable Stalin met his end, leaving behind a legacy of terror, but also a glimmer of hope. With his demise, whispers of defiance began to circulate, not just within the borders of the USSR, but also in the satellite states under the boot of Soviet rule. With the death of the paranoid dictator, hope of reform and collective resistance against Moscow might finally become manifest. This hope was spurred on by a speech by Stalin's successor. In February 1956, behind closed doors, Khrushchev, the new Soviet premier, made a secret speech to his comrades at the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. In this, he denounced the oppressive rule of Stalin, criticizing the abuse of human rights and the cult of the individual. Khrushchev spoke candidly of his predecessor in disparaging terms, stating that Stalin had asserted his character above the party and provided letters showing that Lenin himself had warned of Stalin's rude and tempestuous character. However, somehow, the secret speech was leaked. Some say that the speech was leaked and translated by the CIA and the Mossad to deliberately destabilize the Eastern Bloc. Others believe that the leak came from within the communists' own ranks in Poland. We will probably never know the details of how the secret was unlocked, but this speech resonated throughout Eastern Europe, setting the hope of a freer society. After some gains in Poland, Hungarian audiences began to push for a more decentralized and locally tailored form of communism. Yet despite Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin, the USSR was not ready for radical liberalization. In reality, notions of a more liberalized and decentralized Eastern Bloc collided with the hard geopolitical realities of the early Cold War. Fearing invasion from the East, the West had formed the NATO alliance in 1949. Concurrently, the USSR established buffer states to prevent another invasion from the West, also accelerating its efforts to match and possibly exceed the nuclear capabilities shown by the USA in Japan at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In 1955, West Germany was permitted by the West to rearm and join NATO, and in response, the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union formed the Warsaw Pact in May 1955. It was against this backdrop of rising nuclear tension that the buffer states hoped, perhaps naively, for more freedom, independence, and autonomy. With growing unrest about economic and political fortunes, the unpopular Hungarian leader Matthias Rakosi was replaced by Erno Jero. As a gesture of goodwill, Jero allowed the body of a communist Hungarian reformer, executed by Stalinists in 1949, to be reburied in Budapest. However, rather than easing tensions, this surfaced deeper feelings of resentment held by the Hungarians towards the Soviet system and the many injustices they had faced at their hands. On the 23rd of October 1956, a group of university students, supported by a larger civil protest in Budapest, entered the building of a radio station to place their demands for political and economic reforms. Outside, the supporting civil protest came under fire by the police, and several protesters were killed. But strangely, rather than sinking into a state of atomized fear, rebellion and street fighting began to spread. Revolutionary militias formed to fight against the police, and local communist leaders were captured and killed. The Hungarian military intervened, but lines of authority were broken, and some soldiers even turned their support to the revolutionaries. Jero soon requested assistance from Soviet troops, who were deployed on the 24th of October. But still, protests continued, and hundreds of lives were lost and many injured. Eventually, control was taken from the Moscow-friendly Hungarian Working People's Party and given to the revolutionaries. This first phase of the uprising was a victory for the rebels. 
a new government under Imre Nagy was formed, and he pledged to hold free democratic elections with a multi-party system. Nagy called for the removal of all Soviet troops from Hungary, and on the 1st of November 1956, Nagy announced Hungarian neutrality and a clear intention to leave the Warsaw Pact, also calling for the United Nations for protection. But no aid from the West was forthcoming for numerous reasons. First, the West and the Soviet Union had demarcated Eastern Europe as part of the Soviet sphere of influence during the Yalta Conference. Thus, to meddle in the affairs of the Eastern Bloc risked direct confrontation between NATO and the USSR, a war which most people did not want. The uprising also occurred during a strange time in Soviet-American relations. At the exact same time as Hungary was embroiled in chaos, the Suez Crisis was unfolding in Egypt, which saw the imperial powers of France and Britain attempt to establish control over the Suez Canal. In a rare moment of agreement, the Soviet Union and the US were united in their condemnation, complicating any US involvement in the Hungarian crisis. Without Western backing, the Hungarian uprising was doomed. The USSR accused Nagy of being a counter-revolutionary, and on the night of the 3rd of November, 60,000 Soviet troops entered Hungary to implement a regime change. In just a few days, the Soviets had quashed the rebellion and restored its control over Hungary. As many as 26,000 Hungarians were subsequently tried and imprisoned or executed. Many were prevented from fleeing the country, and some 200,000 were displaced. As for Nagy, he took refuge in the Yugoslavian embassy in Budapest, but he was later arrested and deported to Romania. In June 1958, alongside his comrades, he was tried, executed, and buried in an unmarked grave. The Soviet invasion of Hungary, although short, was bloody, with 2,500 Hungarians and 700 Soviet troops killed. But the effect was to leave a message to all members of the Eastern Bloc, pull into line behind the Moscow-centered policy. Khrushchev showed that whilst he wanted to de-Stalinize the Soviet Union, there was a continued need for centralized Leninist communism. Ultimately, the Eastern Bloc was not yet going to achieve full sovereignty. The USSR was adamant that the Eastern Bloc buffer states were imperative to its security. Just over a decade later, similar calls for reform would collide yet again with the geopolitical goals of the Soviet Union, only this time in Czechoslovakia. To find out about the Prague Spring and the subsequent Soviet invasion of their ally, check out this video.